Well, hey, all you wiretappers out there back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. I got a little different studio look, a little different camera placement. Anyhow, I was messing around trying to clean some stuff up and put some books in, in the thing, in the bookcase and throw some stuff away. And so it's still a mess in here, but it's a little better of a mess. I, I want to talk a little more about that great book, The Outfit by Gus Russo. And thanks to Ben Ellickson for getting me that book. Um Talk about Al Capone, and he talked about the hypocrisy of the American justice system and the robber barons of the time and kind of compared himself to some of them. Um, you know, Al Capone ran a bootleg empire like a corporation. He had divisions and he had managers. He had general managers. He had unit leaders. He had workers. He had a division of labor. You know, you might be a driver. You might work in the brewery. You might be responsible for sales to go out and make sure that the all the uh, speakeasies are, were using his booze. You had enforcement uh, when somebody wasn't paying their bills or if you had uh, you had to have protection, you had to have security because other bootleggers and maybe hijack one of your trucks. So uh, but you had to have all those different divisions and then you had to have managers over them. And he also had a political arm, a politically political lobbying arm ran by Curly Humphreys, a Welshman. Uh, he had uh, Jake Guzik, who was handled as a lot of the numbers in the business. Uh, he had uh, his enforcement arm was ran by Tony Accardo back in the day. Accardo, of course, started out as his bodyguard and supposedly would sit out in front of the Lexington Hotel with a Chicago typewriter in his hand. I don't know that that sounds a little too uh, movie star mo movies to me. He also had a succession plan. He had Frank Nitty all ready to step up and go. Now, he wasn't, you know, born and bred in the mafia. He was from Naples, but, you know, he used all that mafia kind of uh, organization to make all this work. Nitty, he came out of the Brooklyn to Chicago gangster pipeline. There's really no evidence that he knew uh, uh, Capone when he was in Brooklyn, where he first landed when he was a young kid and then came to Chicago. He trained as a barber. Um, after he got to Chicago, he started, he, he first became a fence. So that takes a lot of organization. You know, you have to have outlets, you have to have contacts with businesses that will take your swag or, or you know, storefronts or vendors, somebody to sell your swag that you get from professional criminals who steal it all the time. And you will have to have those guys all lined up too. So that takes a certain amount of organization, uh, he, he moved into the Capone Torrio bootlegging organization pretty quick as a top shelf Canadian whiskey smuggler. Uh, when Capone went away, Nettie was his, his, his right hand at the time, and he took over as boss. And, you know, the boss always bears the brunt of the press and law enforcement attention. And he listened to Capone's board of directors, and that was Paul the Waiter Rica and Anthony Accardo, Cherry Nose Gioi, and a few others. Matter of fact, in, in the end, Nettie they told him that he had to take the load for this Hollywood scam, the extortion out in Hollywood. And they wanted him to go to prison behind it. And he went out and committed suicide the next day. And a whole bunch of the rest of those guys went, they were all going down. Anyhow, I don't know what was in their minds. I think maybe they probably agreed that we're all going down uh, that day. And then he just, he couldn't take it. He couldn't do another bit in penitentiary. Now, Capone liked to compare this organization that he's built with these other people to supposedly legitimate companies and other robber barons like Andrew Cargany, Carnegie, uh, Cornelius Van Vanderbilt, Railroads, John D. Rockefeller Oil. And uh, the robber baron, railroad man, Cornelius Vanderbilt once said, you don't think I could run a railroad in accordance to the statutes, do you? This was a long time before the FDA, the FTC, the Fair Labor Standards Act, or in, there were no other federal regulatory, regulatory agencies and no other really federal regulations. States might have a little bit, but these were all interstate companies, so it was it was tough. It was also a time when people, you know, they were they were victimizing their employees as much as they could. And as men tried to form labor unions to establish themselves and, and make 
management listen to them and pay them a fair wage, not just robbing them of their labor and sticking it in their pocket. Guys like Henry Ford would hire Pinkerton thugs, and, and these other guys would do that too. Would hire Pinkerton thugs to beat up strikers and to try to use friendly police to try to get information on labor union people. And they called them all communists and, and tried to hamper any union e efforts uh, under by any means necessary. So they were they were just like mobsters. Uh, many mislabeled and dangerous goods were put in the marketplace. And, and, you know, that's one of the more famous stories about the goods in the marketplace. You know, the Deidre Capone, Al Capone's niece, claims that it was her uncle, Al Capone, and her dad, Ralph Capone, that forced the milk people, the dairy people, to put a, a expiration date on each bottle of milk because one of their children got really sick from some rancid milk. So, you know, once again, he's uh, that's a pretty famous story that Al Capone forced the uh, the dairies to put an expiration date, you know, kind of the first FDA was Al Capone. Interesting, huh? You know, he once gave an interview uh, to a magazine, a legitimate magazine called Liberty Magazine. And he was talking about when he was down in Florida, he said, well, down in Florida, when I lived, there's a shady newspaper publisher. And he had a friend that was running a bank and the bank was about to fail. So this guy unloaded worthless securities on unsuspecting people. And as people were drawing their money out of that bank, these people that now had stock in that bank, it was it was going down the tubes. People were drawing their money out of the bank at maybe 30 cents on the dollar. Well, another guy who was a friend of the banker and a friend of the newspaper man and the newspaper man, they all encouraged all these people drawing money out of the bank to put it in this other bank. And that other bank would fail shortly after. So and, and nobody went to jail. Uh, and, and he said, you know, they didn't go to jail and they're among Florida's most respected citizens today. So, you know, he it frustrated him. You know, he was just selling a product that everybody wanted, except a few people who got this Volstead Act passed. He also compared himself to another robber baron named Joseph P. Kennedy. Uh, supposedly they had uh, some kind of bootlegging thing going. I, I don't know. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Uh, one example of Joe Kennedy's gangsterism was when he wanted to buy up a chain of film theaters. The owner, a man named Alexander Pantagenes, refused. Uh, Kennedy paid a 17-year-old girl to accuse him of rape. This is a pretty well-documented story. Kennedy got friendly cops and a court to arrest him and charge him, and he got 50 years in prison. This conviction was later reversed when the girl was confronted and with her part in it, and she committed suicide before she could ever give her testimony. During this trouble, Kennedy was able to purchase this theater chain for pennies on the dollar. You know, that, that's Kennedy, dude. In regards to that bootlegging business of Joseph Kennedy and Al Capone, you know, to find real solid information on that other than just a blanket statement, I couldn't really find it. Best I could find was Joe Kennedy's dad was a long time. He had a started out with a bar. Patrick Joseph Kennedy was his name. Pretty original in her names, aren't they? He had a bar, but he'd also gotten a wholesale liquor business. And so when the Volst Act, Act was passed, the prohibition passed, if you already had stores of liquor, you could continue selling it until it was gone because it Prohibition law banned the manufacture, sale, and transportation of his intoxicating liquors. It wasn't really illegal to drink alcohol in the 1920s. The real money that Kennedy made from alcohol really was later on in 1933 when Prohibition was going to be overturned. He already he had these good connections. He had made a lot of money in the stock market and, and other kind of finky stock market deals. Uh, and he got exclusive contracts to start importing uh, high-end scotch and uh, gin from uh, England. And these deals with these top shelf British distillers like Dewar's and George Gordon's were really lucrative. When prohibition was lifted, he was ready to go. And this liquor distributorship for these exclusive di distributorship for these top shelf uh, bottles of booze uh, really netted him a lot of money. He was able to walk away when he sold it a few years later, 10 years later, he made more than a hundred million in today's dollars. He didn't have that much of an investment in it either when he first just to get that distributorship. 
So that's a little compare and contrast with Al Capone and other robber barons of the day. Thanks again to Chicago's best backhoe operator, Ben Ellickson. He got me this book by Gus Russo called The Outfit. It's a great book. Got a lot of details, a lot of good stories like this. Now, Ben Ellickson, let me tell you a little bit about him. He's the guy that can pick up a small Prohibition era glass whiskey bottle with a huge backhoe and deposit it gently on the side of the trench he's digging. And then he sent it to me. So once again, Ben, you're my friend, and I really appreciate everything you've done for the podcast over the years. And I want to get back up to Chicago and, and we'll have some more, more barbecue. Uh, I can't remember the name of that joint we ate at before. Or maybe we should try uh, some other kind of food up there. They got the deep dish pizza. What other Chicago famous dishes are there that I need to try next time I go up, guys? Comment back on my Gangland Wire podcast page, Facebook page, if you do Facebook. Anyhow, thanks a lot, guys. Don't forget that I like to ride motorcycles, so watch out for motorcycles when you're out there. And if you have a problem with PTSD and you've been in the service, get to that VA website, get that hotline number. Problem with drugs or alcohol, which goes hand in hand with PTSD. Find Anthony Ruggiano, former Gambino man. He's a drug and alcohol counselor. He has a website. Uh, let me know if you use him as your drug and alcohol counselor. I won't give up your name. I just want to know about it. He's a good guy. So thanks a lot, guys. Uh, like and subscribe. Tell your friends about it and, and keep coming back, as we say. Thanks, guys.